Good morning, everyone. It's about time to start. I want to welcome everyone to our service this morning. We do have a few visitors with us. I uh, appreciate your presence. Uh, as always, uh, it's good to see not only the visitors out, but all of our members out. And it's good to be together again on a Lord's Day. Uh, if you uh, have not picked up one of the bulletins in the back, we have them on the table as you enter in the foyer. Uh, there's a number of things in the bulletin that we encourage you to take a look at. Uh, people that we need to remember in our prayers. Uh, there were a couple of absences uh, that, that didn't make it in. Um, Rob let me know this morning that uh, Saki Pretorius, who preached here uh, for a little while after uh, John Lasseter, uh, is in the hospital in North Carolina and is not expected to live much longer. Uh, it's a heart failure there, uh, so we need to keep uh, his family in our prayers. Uh, he's been a faithful servant of the Lord uh, for many, many, many years and uh, just recently retired. So. We uh, want to keep that family in our uh, Also, Mark let me know that uh, all of the funds that were necessary to meet the current need there in India were, were collected. We certainly appreciate everyone's generosity and helping out with that. Um, we know that we are richly blessed. And as we think about uh, the, the fact that we do support things both from our treasury and as we encourage the individuals, as all of you know, our kind of mantra on that, uh, we need to keep in mind that we, we, we're so richly blessed. We have an opportunity at each Lord's Day to contribute back part of what the uh, Lord has given us. Uh, as you leave the building, there's a little box on the wall on each side. If you have a contribution you'd like to leave, just put it in that box, and we would greatly appreciate it. Uh, we use our funds here for a number of different things, and uh, one of the things that we try to highlight uh, every so often is a couple of the uh, cases where we've had uh, an opportunity to help others, uh, either in evangelism, or in this case, uh, we were able to help supply some of the need in a, in a drought and a famine situation uh, for some of the members of the church that were in, uh, in Africa. So we want to continue to remember the Lord, the Lord's people, and not only here in this place, uh, but all over the world. If you have a songbook, our uh, song leading this morning will be uh, led by Brother Howe, and uh, as we continue through the service, let us kind of settle into thinking about God and thinking about where we're going and thinking about our worship and praise to Him this morning as we open it with words of song.
pray. Our Lord God, we bow before you. We praise your name and thank you for the three of you as a great blessing. We have many to pray for in our congregation dealing with health, dealing with uh, jobs and family issues. We pray for our members. We pray for our friends and family of our members, some who are battling uh, sickness. We pray for the congregation here and the work, and we thank you for all of our blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
So as we prepare to take part of, uh, of this remembrance of our Lord and Savior, I want to take some time and read a couple verses from Isaiah chapter 53. Uh, if you can, while I'm reading these, please just think about our Lord Jesus, our Savior, and what He did for us. So Isaiah chapter 53, starting with verse 4, says, Surely He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed Him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon Him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we were healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquities of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. And like a sheep that before its shearer is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offering, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, and makes intercession for the transgressors. Would you please join me in prayer? Father, great is your name and merciful. You're so merciful, Lord. We, we come to you as, as your servants, as your children, to thank you for this opportunity that we have to, to be able to speak to you and to be part of your family and all that thanks to our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for, for sending him. And thank you so much for, for the blessing that we can get to know about him through your word. Please, Lord, let us remember him now as we take part of this bread. But let us not stop there. Let us also remember that he was risen and that he is among us now. Let us remember the, the mission that he set out for us. And let us always try to do our best job towards achieving that mission on every day that you bless us with life. Father, uh, thank you for everything. Thank you most for our Lord Jesus Christ, and it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Luke 22, 20 says, After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, This cup is a new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. Let's pray. Lord, we truly thank you for the ultimate sacrifice that you provided all of us here today, uh, not even truly knowing us. You you open up your heart and, and uh, 
you know, are able to go through this sacrifice, this crucifixion, and, and uh, you, know, you, you did this so that we could be forgiven of our sins. And Lord, through you, we're able to live a more perfect life, and we thank you for that. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Number 85, it's convenient to stand. We'll sing the first, second, and fourth first times.
just a few that would sit up here on the front. Uh, that was back in the days when Nathan Perkins was young enough to sit up on the front with them. He's been pushed back several ways. Now they fill up on those two rows there. They're filling up a half a row here. It just, it, it just keeps enlarging, and we're grateful for that. That is a special blessing. Uh, that obviously is the Lord's Church. Should He allow us to live uh, and allow things to continue to go on, that's the, the future uh, generation of the Lord's Church. And so we're so grateful to be able to have that many young people here. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 10 if you would. Also, a special welcome to any that are visiting with us. We always have visitors, and we're so grateful for that as well. We hope and pray beyond anything else that when you leave here today, you will have seen and heard the name of God glorified. That's our goal in being here this morning, is that we can <coughs> lift up his name and help people to see him a little more clearly by the things that we do. In Acts chapter 10... <coughs> There is a statement made uh, after the teaching of Cornelius, and Peter has, uh, like many of the Jews at that time, Peter really didn't understand the, the breaking down of the barrier between all peoples, and so really they hadn't done much as far as preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. It hadn't, uh, hadn't happened with a, a great deal of uh, consistency. A few had gone a couple of different places, but in Acts chapter 10, uh, you have Peter having that vision. If you go back and read that story where uh, a sheet is lowered, there's all kinds of animals that he sees as clean and unclean, and God uses that vision to help him understand that there is no such thing as clean and unclean any longer. No longer is there unclean and unclean as far as animals were concerned for the Jews because that, that old law had been nailed to the cross. But he's also trying to get Peter to understand the Gentiles are to receive the gospel the same way as the Jews receive the gospel. And so after that whole discussion, uh, there's a statement made in Acts chapter 10 that helps us to understand that what Peter is saying is this is not new news, really. Uh, it, it, the old law had died, but God had always intended to bless all nations. And what he says is, you can go back and read the Old Testament and see that Christ is spoken about in the Old Testament with great regularity. As a matter of fact, uh, I know Ken and Debbie both took, and anybody else that attended Florida College, uh, we took classes that, were a class that was called Scheme of Redemption. And the whole idea was showing how from the beginning of the Bible all the way through, it has one theme. The book we used was actually called the theme of the Bible, the workbook that we used with that, because the theme is the same, that God is correcting what Adam and Eve had done in the garden and bringing about a solution to that by bringing a Savior into the world. And so both Old and New Testament really have a great focus on Jesus Christ. And so what is said in Acts chapter 10 is in verse 43. All right, let's back up to verse 42. It says, And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and of the dead. Talking about Jesus Christ. And it says, To him, Jesus, to him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. He says, all the prophets. You, you can go back and look at the Old Testament. He's saying, the Old Testament is going to tell you a great deal that we can understand about Jesus Christ. And sometimes we don't go back and really look at some of those lessons. I do want to look at one of them this morning because uh, there, there are some great types and antitypes. There are some great stories that help us to understand uh, different aspects of Jesus and about the salvation. And so the lesson that we have this morning is actually <coughs> entitled, Jesus and the servant. Here's the thing, though. That gives an image of the garden there. And the serpent that tempted Eve, and Eve in turn giving also the fruit to her husband, we really don't want to talk about Jesus and that serpent. I want to talk about Jesus and another serpent in the Old Testament. I want to talk about Jesus and this serpent. 
If you want to turn in your Bibles back to Numbers chapter 24, excuse me, I'm sorry, Numbers chapter 21, we're going to see that there is a great story in the Old Testament that helps us to understand that this message of Christ has been preached and taught from the very old days. Now we know there were prophecies even in the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3 when the man and the woman are cursed and actually the ground and the woman are cursed but the, uh, the man suffers because of that curse. And then the, you have the ground being cursed and you have the woman being cursed and as a result of that the serpent is also cursed. And you have your first prophecy all the way back in Genesis chapter 3 about Jesus Christ when it talks about the seed of woman will in fact crush the head of the serpent. And so Jesus is going to win the ultimate victory and we're told that all the way back in Genesis chapter 3 as soon as man fell. And so as we think about uh, the idea uh, of Jesus being taught, when you get over into Numbers, as a matter of fact, let me just skip for a second, Galatians chapter 3 tells us that Abraham heard the gospel preached. I think that's interesting. You know, the gospel is the good news. Well, there was good news. He was told specifically what? Back in Genesis chapter 12, he was told, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed through your seed. And then you get over to Galatians, and it tells us that seed was singular. It was one. It was Jesus Christ. That was the blessing that was going to be provided to all nations that Abraham was told about all the way back then. So the gospel was preached to Abraham in Galatians chapter 3. Well, we get over to Numbers chapter 21, and what we find is this is, uh, this is a people, you ever, as a parent, maybe I should ask this, you ever as a parent just kind of have to bite your tongue a little bit and, or hold your breath a little bit and just, it's like, look, we've been through this before. You know, the, the, it's going to require a little patience here. I, I'm going to have to have some patience because sometimes, sometimes, your children just weary you, do they not, as you go through different things. They just weary you a little bit. And so, so you, you're, you're wrestling. You ever wonder about our Heavenly Father? How wearied does God get with us, with his people in general? You know, back in chapter 20 of Numbers is, is when Moses struck the rock, if you remember that story. But even if you don't, what Moses says is you rebellious people, this, this rebellious group, you rebels, they, they were people that had seen incredible things. By God. I, I would just ask you, how many, how many incredible things have you experienced in your life at the hand of God? How many great things, how many great blessings have you experienced at the hand of God? We're, we are no different than they are in that sense. And, and yet, they, they constantly, when things weren't going their way, they constantly turned their back on God and said things and did things and so Moses says you rebels and, and you get down into chapter 21 and, and they've got another problem you have a Canaanite king who has taken uh, several of the Israelites captive in the first few verses there and, and Israel prays to God and says if you'll deliver him into our hands we'll do what we need to do We'll dedicate those cities to destruction. Uh, here's the, the profession that if you'll take care of us, God, we will, in fact, be who we're supposed to be. So that happens in the first four verses, or first three verses. Then I want you to pick up with me in verse four. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. I, I, I mean, I, I understand. That sounds unbelievably bold, does it not? Unbelievably callous and careless to speak about God and God's leader that way. We loathe this food that you've given us. I don't like reading that verse really a lot because there, there have been times that 
Uh, I, I've complained about the food that I have. And I can still remember, I met a guy named Nomi, uh, who was from Nigeria. Met him several years ago. And a whole group of us, and you may have, some of you may have even heard me say this before, but a group of us were sitting around talking at someone's house. He was in this country. We were, we were sitting around talking and we were eating lunch and somebody said, oh, I just, I absolutely love this. And so the discussion came up, what's your favorite food? And people are naming their, their favorite food. And somebody said, tell me, what's your favorite food? He said, I don't know, favorite? I don't understand that. He said, if I had food, that was my favorite. I mean, he wasn't in a position like we were, where you, you, know, you can have ice cream, and you can have pizza, or you can have steak, or you can have whatever it is you want. <coughs> he was saying, similar to that picture that we posted up there, you realize how grateful those people were in that picture that was posted a few minutes ago? Just because they received some meal and some grain that they could have a bowl of porridge, if you will. <coughs> These people were getting food from God. And, and they're saying, we love this food. We don't want this. So you expect the Lord to be happy about that? No. I can still remember when our boys did that. Complained about what Judy fixed. Repeatedly. It was good food. But they were in that complaining stage. And so they got their first introduction to liver and onions. <laughs> Judy left. I cooked them some liver as badly as I could possibly cook it, as strong as it could be. And I fixed them a boiled down plate of mustard greens to go with it just to help take the edge off. Perspective. We weren't real happy about their complaints, and so that was our method of dealing with it. God dealt with it even more severely. It says, then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it up on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. And so Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. That's the serpent we want to talk about today. Because we are told that just as that serpent was lifted up, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now think about what happened here. Because they, they got bitten by these snakes. And, and what you're going to find is that there's three things that I want us to pick up on this this morning. One that we've already mentioned, this Old Testament teaches the gospel. This picture is exactly intended to teach a picture, a lesson about Jesus Christ. And, and a picture that helps us understand something about Jesus Christ and, and his life. And isn't it interesting that God says, you put up the brass serpent, you put up this bronze serpent, you put it up on a pole, and whosoever shall look upon it shall not die. He shall be saved. That sounds similar to a statement in the New Testament, does it not? Not so much to look upon, but doesn't that sound similar to the statement that when Jesus was teaching Nicodemus? And you remember, you get down toward uh, the middle part there, the end of John, and he says in verse 16, that what? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that what? That whosoever should believe on him. <coughs> Similar verse. The idea, you know what? Whoever comes to this solution here can have the blessing of God. Whoever came to that solution. Very similar verse. Well, there's a reason for that. I want you to turn over to John for a minute. They sound similar. Because of the nature of that whole passage. Jesus is teaching Nicodemus. And he has that whole discussion with Nicodemus about, you know, don't, don't you understand these things? You, you should understand things uh, better than uh, you do. And so as he's teaching him, uh, in, in John chapter 3, 
you, you have this great statement about the whosoever shall believe in him in, in verse 16. So for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And I want you to back up with me. Because as he's discussing the things with Nicodemus, including the idea of being born again and the things that go along with that, he says, and pick up with me if you would in verse 9. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Jesus said this was preached. This whole concept. You're the teacher of Israel. You understand what the law says. You understand what God has told you before. He says, do you not understand? Because exactly as that serpent was lifted up, he said that's the exact picture. The Son of Man is going to have to be lifted up. Why? Because all mankind has been bitten. That's the nature of sin. He says, so what do you do? Because at some point in our lives, when, when we are old enough to understand, when we can grasp the concept of what is sin and what is not, and what the consequences are, we realize we've been bitten by the serpent. And we have sin in our lives. He says, and so now what are we going to do? What are we going to do about that sin? Because he says the Son of Man has to be lifted up. The same as that serpent was lifted up. This is Jesus saying that picture is me. You need to understand that. Because there's not going to be any other solution to sin than me. There was no other solution to having been bitten by the snakes than to look upon the bronze serpent that was raised on the pole. So why? You ever think about that? I mean, the, the, the whole symbolism that is there. The, the serpent represents the curse, really, doesn't he? From the garden, that first picture that we showed. You. It was the serpent that came to Adam and Eve and tempted them to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they, they did. She ate, and she gave to her husband, and he ate, and then they were driven from the garden. And they were cursed. They no longer had access to the tree of life. Man was going to have to work by the sweat of his brow. Woman was going to have great pains in childbirth. There were several things that were pronounced at that time. And that serpent, if, if you think serpent, matter of fact, I can, t I can tell you this. I'll get in trouble for this again because I'm going to mention my wife. Maybe if I don't mention her by name, then, then I'll, I'll, I'll be a problem. <laughs> I, I don't dislike snakes. I have a son that doesn't dislike snakes. We both have always been kind of fascinated with snakes. She takes a different viewpoint than I do on that. Probably a viewpoint that others take as well. She hates every snake. And her reasoning is, Satan was a serpent in the garden, therefore, every snake is bad. I, I, I don't think that really proves true logically, but I understand the concept. But that's what you think of. If somebody says serpent, and you're thinking Bible, isn't that the first thing you think of? Satan. And, and how he represents the curse. And, and then you think of being lifted up on, a, uh, on this, this bronze serpent, this bronze pole, this, this all being put together, uh, this pole. The, the bronze seems throughout the scriptures and the brass to represent even the judgment of God. When, when he comes... In judgment against his people on more than one occasion, it talks about, and his feet are like the brass or the bronze. That's the nature of it. The, the, the judgment of God. You've got the servant and the judgment of God against the people, and there has to be a solution. But what I love about this story is because even in the Old Testament, though they had laws they need to follow, and there was that old law for the Jews, 
This story teaches us that the gospel, as well as this story, is based on faith, which is based on the grace of God. What was the solution here? You know, we're told in other places, we're told in Romans, we're told in other places, you, 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 cannot, you cannot do anything to earn your way into heaven. We understand that. You cannot. You can't be good enough to earn your way into heaven. And so it's only by the grace of God, and we know that, that salvation is by faith or through faith by the grace of God. And we understand that was the whole sending of Jesus to this earth, was that gift, that grace of God. Isn't it interesting that in this whole scenario that is going to give us a picture of Jesus Christ, that this pole is lifted up with his bronze serpent, what are they told to do? Whoever looks at it. In other words, you don't have anything to do with your salvation here other than believing the solution. That's what you have to do. You have to believe. You have to actually look up at that. That's what God tells us. He says we have to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And it's only by grace that we have that salvation. Now, they had to physically look up. Would you say, well, there you go. They worked their way into that solution, right? They earned it. You know, if I, if I was looking down, I didn't earn it. But if I looked up at the serpent, there you go, I earned that. God owes me that. No, no, no more than to turn my life around in repentance is a work. Or, or to be buried in baptism it is a work. None of those things are works of man. As a matter of fact, all that is happening within the salvation of man is all the work of God. When I'm baptized, it's the work of God that washes away my sins, not me. Peter says that when he says it's not the water in the sense that it washes away the, the filth of the flesh like, you're, like water would do. It, it's God responding. It's faith. The gospel is based on faith. But it has to have that step first. You, you, have, you have to believe. Can you imagine if there was anybody that was in Israel who was still surviving but had been bitten, anybody who thought, look at the pole with a snake on it, that's just not logical. That doesn't make any sense. You ever wonder why people want to argue with God because it doesn't make sense to us? When God tells us to do things in obedience to him, including being baptized into his name, you realize I've had conversations with people who have made that very argument to me. That makes no sense. Why wouldn't you just do what God asked you to do? What kind of reasoning process can you have if my desire is to follow Him? My desire is to submit to God. My desire is to yield to His will like Jesus Himself did. If that's my desire, and God says, Mark, do, why would I ever question? Why wouldn't I just do if my desire is to yield? God, I'm just looking for something to do. I always picture the angels in heaven and God's beck and call. You know, because he's got a lot of different things he has angels do and a lot of different things that he had angels do in, in, in the past. Hard for me to envision that God says, I need you to go and do this, and an angel saying, don't you have a better job than that? I, I just think they're there at the beck and call of God. God says, go here, they go. Go there. Because they're yielding to him. That's the nature of what God says. He says it is, it is a gospel of faith based on the grace of God, but you still need to obey. Whether it's looking at the bronze pole or the pole with the bronze serpent so that you can be healed from the snake bite or it's coming to Jesus Christ in obedience so I can be forgiven of my sins he says either but then I want you to notice one final thing that I think is, it is such a key here because Jesus we're told became the curse for us he was the one that was hung on the cross on the tree, on the pole, if you will. It's Jesus that was nailed to the cross to become the curse for us so we could have salvation. 
But I think it's interesting because what did the Jews ask Moses to ask God? You remember what they asked him? They said, pray to God and ask him to remove the snakes. That's what they requested. That is not what they got. Well, because I think what we need to understand is that the grace of God provides a remedy for sin, not a removal of the source or the problem. I'm not saying he doesn't remove the, er, remove the consequence. We are forgiven of the sin, but we're still in the same sinful world that we were before. He has not removed sin from the world. The grace of God did not. God could have destroyed all the snakes and healed all the people without any of the other fanfare, couldn't he? But he had a picture to show and a lesson to teach. And so he did. And so sin is still here. Sin is still rampant in this world and has been since the garden. I can still remember Melvin Curry listening to a young man who was praying and he prayed something to the equivalent of God, please remove all sin from the world. To which Brother Curry went up and talked to him after and said, I just, you know, it's important you understand what you're asking for. Always make sure you understand what you're asking for when you pray. He says, what you're asking for is for the end of the world. Because sin's not leaving until the end of the world. Because man is here and man is sinful. He said, so as long as that's what you are asking for, then I'm okay with you praying that. But if you're not asking for that, then make sure you're praying for what you, what you intend. Sin's, sin's here. God doesn't remove sin from around us. Paul even says, look, you're in this world. You can't be a part of it in that sense, but you're in it. But what does he do? Provides a remedy. That, brethren, is the good news. Amen. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came. He hung on that cross. He became the curse for us. Amen. And he died. And he was raised again so that we can have a remedy. Sin's not gone. But God says, I can take care of it. If you'll just be obedient to me. It's important. My first decision, your first decision, has to be, is it my will to yield to the will of God? That has to be the first decision. But if you make that one, yes, it is my will to yield to the will of God. You realize how easy that makes everything else as far as decision making? I'm not saying life becomes easy. Life is still hard. But the decision has already been made. One decision makes them all if you've never made that decision, we would encourage you to do that today. Yield your life to Jesus Christ, to God, so that you can have an opportunity to not only sing this song right now, but to think in your mind and know in your mind that that, in fact, is true. We are marching to Zion together, all headed toward a heavenly home with God. We'd love to help you this morning. We'd love to baptize you into Christ if you understand that's what he says for you to do based on your belief and confession and your, based on your turning from your life and, and serving yourself to serving him. If not, please, study it more. Study it with us. It, we'd love that. For those of us that are Christians, may we understand the sin is still there. God gave us the remedy. May God be praised for that daily in our lives. We can help you. Let us know while we stand, while we sing. We and the Lord and
it's been good to be here. I hope that everyone has uh, gotten something out of this service, but more importantly, that you put your hearts into it. As we think about this coming week, um, let's keep in mind uh, the important parts of the lessons that we've talked about today. Uh, we sung some great songs. Kyle, thank you for leading those. Uh, and as we think about Mark's lesson, uh, it's, it's not a one-time decision either. It's a every day, making sure that we understand the sin still in the world and that we still have to be on the guard against it. Uh, and that's what we're here to help each other do, is to be on guard against that. Anything else that we need to announce before we close today? If not, we'd like to close the Dear God, and the Heavenly Father, this time we uh, come before you, uh, this episode, thankful for uh, your love that you have uh, shown us and you've given us. Uh, we are thankful for your son who uh, died for, uh, for us, free of sin, for such a sinful world that we may all have the hope of salvation. And at this time, also, we ask that uh, you be with this congregation and you also be uh, with the congregations around the world, especially those uh, at, at other places around, such as uh, South Africa, who is just facing such a time of unrest and turmoil, that you uh, be there uh, for their uh, safety, and uh, that through the uh, the times that they also are able to grow in faith as well. We uh, pray that uh, you be with, with those who are uh, sick, or who are, uh, have the ailments of the flesh. Uh, we pray that you be with the family of Jesse Garcia, that uh, they can have a rapid recovery, as well as uh, also be there for the rights as uh, we anticipate a, a baby boy. Uh, I'd also like to extend uh, just uh, our thanks for uh, Lauer's test, have this opportunity to come together in this day as we uh, uh, edify each other, one another. And we also ask that you, know, we, that you uh, forgive us of our sins. It's in your son's name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.